You know, there's quick, and then there is lightning hot quick. <laughs> and that's Troy Bell. This guy can play. He's just so fast. He turns the corner. If you give help, he's going to find guys. He does so there. Troy Delvon Bell, born November 10th, 1980. Today's feature is the quickest college guard I've ever seen. Not the fastest, but definitely the quickest and created the most space between he and defenders. He was a bucket since day one entering college and a long time before that in his amateur career. His most notable and also most underground highlight is that he once beat Michael Jordan one-on-one -on -one for 10K. But those that had the chance to watch a young Troy Bell along his journey, you remember how dominant this guy was at Boston College and how magical he made some of his shots look. One of the best guards, 6'1 and under, I've had the chance to study, but also one of the biggest stunner growth stories you'll ever have the chance to see. I had the chance to sit down with him and get his story from his mouth, and most of that sit down you'll see here. Quick preview, it's safe to say he hated Dante Jones. It's also safe to say he's an hilarious storyteller and a good dude who I've gained so much more respect for. Why did this highly decorated amateur player that was good enough to beat the greatest of all time only last 34 minutes in the league? Let's get into it. Salute to Troy Bell for his time allowed to us and salute to Cat Flynn XX3 for this request. It's your boy JC Stunnergrow3.com. Get it, man. I'm Troy Bell, and this is my stunted growth story. Now, this feature may be biased because I like this guy, man. He's one of my sit downs that I can actually see me being friends with in real life, and a no holds barred, genuine guy that's also a perfectionist about his image. Even with the bias, I truly love his game, and I think his story will be crucial to some younger player out there that hears this. Troy Bell is from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and was as decorated as they come in his city. He was a four-year letter winner and Mr. Basketball finalist in Minnesota. As a senior, he averaged a crazy 40 points, six rebounds, and four assists a game. He finished as a top five scorer in the state, but wasn't recruited heavily with Xavier and Boston College as his two final university choices. After visiting Boston College and feeling the love from the players on the team and being comfortable with the potential situation, he decided that that was the place for him. And what a great decision that was because he came in and right away was a star and leader for the program. Coming from Minnesota, you know, a very small market at the time. Now we have a lot of uh, a lot of ballers now. Um, yeah. Matter of fact, Chet Homer, and they just named him number one high school player yeah. in the country. Yeah. You know, that was kind of yeah. unheard of for Minnesota. Uh -huh. So, so when I was coming out, we got no respect, though. Zero respect. So when I was going to the Big East, man, um, especially after Kyle Elamine, who's also from Minnesota, came off a championship. So my freshman year. He the year before I got there, they had won UConn won the championship with him and Rip Hamilton, all those guys. So me watching his success gave me a lot of confidence that that I could come in and also be successful. Obviously, two totally different situations, but sometimes when you see somebody from your town do something, it just kind of gives you a little extra confidence. So, hmm. you know, um, I, I planned on doing well. I came in there focused. I worked my butt off uh, the summer before I got there, playing in the pro ams and just staying in the gym. You know, I think a lot of freshmen come in and they're thinking, you know, I'll figure it out. Let me yeah, kind of get my feet wet. Exactly. But, but I, that's not that's not how I came in. Stunt number one, injury. You know what? I actually averaged 20.1 points a game as a freshman. And I actually passed Allen Iverson, who averaged 19.8 in the Big East. So I was the first freshman to average 20 points a game in the Big East ever. So. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was it was pretty cool, man. When we came into into that next season, we were ready. We were mm -hmm. ready. But since we're on stunted, but since we're on stunted growth, let me also tell you that I missed the last three or four games of the season my freshman year to a knee surgery, um, and that's and that's how this stunted growth story started. So first knee surgery after freshman year, going into my sophomore year. But you know, this was back before anyone knew what was going on with players, so nobody knew. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I bounced, I bounced back, but I did miss four games at the end of the season, my freshman year. But, mm -hmm. but going into my sophomore year, coming off that summer where we traveled to uh, France and Switzerland, I felt amazing, and the team felt amazing too. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, your sophomore year ends, 
Um, would you say it was a success individually and, and, and team wise? Definitely. Um, so we we ended, we actually broke a record uh, from going from going from worst to first. Uh, my freshman year, we were 11 and 19. Then my sophomore year, we were 27 and five. So we broke some type of record with that. And um, Coach Skinner got coach of the year. I got uh, player of the year, second team All American, and Big East tournament MVP. So uh, we. I, couldn't couldn't ask for anything more than that. And then yeah. that summer, that summer I actually played on the USA team, and we went and got a gold medal. So I was uh, just, just felt great. You know, I was yeah. playing good basketball, and I felt great. For too many players, this stunt goes hand in hand with their story. And as we'll see, Bell was a victim of this since the end of his amazing freshman year. Even though he put up great numbers that broke records of Hall of Famers, this was the beginning of what would be a career-long hindrance for Troy and his growth. I can't express how much I believe had he never sustained the knee injuries he did would be one of the best scorers of his time in the NBA and a household name to this day. As a sophomore in a season where he was even better than in his freshman campaign, he would deal with a knee injury and surgery just two weeks before the season began, but miraculously came back for the opener and averaged over 20 points a game, shot in the high 30s from three and started every game. For a player dealing with injury and coming off a knee surgery, that's just underrated. And I'm glad I had the chance to hear from him and understand deeper what he must have been going through. The team made it to the tournament and was eliminated by USC in the second round. But by that time, the Big East was on notice that Troy Bell was here and would be a problem in the conference. Fast forward to his time in the NBA, he would deal with even more knee injuries that this time, because of so many surgeries and him practically having no tissue between his bones, would cause him to lose that quickness he's shown in college and was a huge factor in him not getting the opportunities to stick around longer. I think I kind of overdid it. Um... And, and, and I'm still learning my body. So I, after, after playing all those games and then having that long summer mm. uh, in training camp, mm. I, I tear my knee. So I have a surgery two weeks before the season starts. And what makes that so bad is that out of all the times of my life, that's the best I was ever feeling. Like mm -hmm. when I'm telling you, when I'm telling you that I was about to play the best basketball I had ever seen me play, mm -hmm. that's how I felt coming off that gold medal, playing with all those guys. Like I just felt great. And then next thing you know, two weeks before the season, I'm on the surgery table, mm -hmm. and, and 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 I, and I still I still played the first, first game after yeah. what maybe two two and a half weeks. And so I didn't give myself the rest I needed or any of that. And, uh, and even into the Big East, things are going great. Give Villanova 38 in the overtime win. Like, I'm getting busy. But mm. then I just hit a point, bro, where my knee was just like, my knee was just like, hey, buddy, nah, nope. We're about to, we need to hang it up. But I still had all these games to play. But my knee was hurt. So I come into my senior year, and we actually got off to a really slow start. I got off to a decent start individually, but the start was slow. We had some freshmen starting. Uh, shout out to Craig Smith, who ended up being a super beast that year. Yeah. But um, but we kind of had some growing pains. Um, I mean, we got on track, but it was mm. a slow start. Mm. It was a slow start. Mm. Star number two, coming back to school. In the late 90s, early 2000s, leaving school early for the NBA wasn't a popular thing to do. In fact, it was normal for star players to stay in school for years. Nowadays, if you go to a big name school and have a successful year, you're basically pushed out the door and guided to the NBA draft where they're waiting for you with open arms. Back then, Troy Bell wasn't given that push. Besides him genuinely wanting to graduate, he wasn't thinking about, neither was anyone in his corner thinking about him leaving early. In my opinion, in hindsight, I wish he had left early and given himself a chance to land on a better fitting team, along with giving himself the chance to use more of his healthier years in the league instead of in college, where you're basically playing for nothing most times. But hindsight is 2020, and it's not what actually happened. He came back to school and as a junior was just on another level as a scorer and leader. Nobody could stay in front of him and no team had a defense that could keep him in check. 
He was confident, still had his quickness that he credits early gymnastics practice for, and he had the ultimate green light, which was deserved for the output he had given to the program. His team made it to the tournament for a second straight year, but lost in the first round to a TJ Ford-led Texas. As a senior, Bell was just outrageous. I mean, talk about a scoring guard. Watching his game for a scorer gives you chills the shots he was making and the space he was creating to get those shots off. He averaged almost 26 points a game, shot a career high 40% from three, attempting eight a game, and shot in the high 80s once again from the free throw line while starting every game. Although the team missed the tournament that year due to some early season losses, Troy was outstanding and obviously one of the best guards in the country and a surefire first round pick heading into the NBA draft. Although I think him leaving earlier would have prevented his next stunt, it was still a great career that I don't think we've seen at that level from a Boston College player ever since. Why didn't you leave after that year right there? You could have went straight to the NBA, been a lottery pick, Right, right. I thought about that uh, a lot. You know, obviously, as you, you know, what, what, what the subject of this, of this show is. So you think about it a lot, bro. But but I think uh, what really made me stay was, you know, I wasn't even though even though I got busy, like in high school and all that senior year, average 36 a game. Like I, I did things, you know, what yeah, I mean? but amazing. I still wasn't like but I wasn't like highly recruited like that. So it wasn't like on my mind that, hey, you're going to the league. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like my, my dad was a bus driver. My mom sold insurance. So my mind, I'm like, I want free college and yeah. a free education. You know, I'm, I got the yeah, normal, yeah. you know, hood, hood, hood player uh, yeah. goals and dreams. You know what I yeah. mean? Like obviously in the back of your mind, you would love to go to the NBA, but mm -hmm. it's kind of far-fetched when you look at the stats. So right. I, and my, my, my first mind was I'm gonna go to school and I'm gonna graduate. You know what I mean? So. That was just kind of my mindset. That era also, like now, if you average a certain amount of points, just say you're you're at a big name school and you average like 14, 15 points, it's like pushed on you. Yo, you need to go, you need to go. In that era, it was it was normal for guys to kind of stay for a year, you know, like no one yeah. was like, you need to go, you need to go. Was that how it was for you? Like nobody pushing you out the door? Nobody was pushing me out the door. Not, mm. not anybody. So, I mean, don't get me wrong. Agents had been calling me. It just wasn't like, not to say the guys don't want to get there because we want to get there. It's yeah. just that it wasn't like it is today where it's like, oh, I had three good games. Maybe I'll go to the draft. You know what I mean? Stunt number three, the Memphis Grizzlies and Hubie Brown. I'm just gonna sit back and let my man tell it because I can't do it justice, nor am I that hilarious. Going to Memphis, man, that... Man, just researching your story, that just broke my heart. Like, what? Like, come <laughs> on, man. So you you wound up getting drafted in, in Memphis. They have all these all right. guys at your position. They got Hubie Brown. What was that like? Bro, here's what's so funny. So before I had got there, uh, Trent Tucker had told me um, that it was going to be rough with Hubie Brown. Mm -hmm. But nobody really gave me no details. You know what I mean? And then yeah. actually uh, Rory Sparrow told me the same thing. Rory Sparrow told me... Uh, at the uh, rookie transition, he's like, where mm -hmm. are you going? I was like, I'm going to Memphis. And he just looked, he just got sad. Like, and I don't even know Rory Sparrow like that. You know what I mean? We were just chopping yeah. it up. And he just was like, and I'm just thinking to myself, like, like it can't be that bad. You know what I mean? Right, like, right, how right. can it be that bad? I've had coaches yeah. that from, you know what I mean? It, oh, rewind though, rewind, bro. So when I get to Memphis, right, uh, mm -hmm. Jerry, Jerry wants me and uh, White Chocolate, Jason Williams to play one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. So, so me and Jay Will, are playing one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Jerry's sitting there in the chair. Jay Will, first play, he got ball. Hit me with this mean crossover, hit this crazy three. I'm like, damn, that was crazy. You know what I mean? I'm like, let me lock up a little more. So mm -hmm. then he drives in, I take it off the glass with two hands, mm -hmm. I get the ball back, and I score like 20 straight. He didn't mm -hmm. get the ball no more. Like, mm -hmm. just, just beasted him. The whole one-on-one -on -one game, it was over. And it was funny because I was trying to, I was trying to talk to him before the game because I'm like, we're teammates now but he didn't really want nothing to do with me. But mm -hmm. after after I whooped him, then it was like, where, where are you from again? What's this yeah. and that? It's like, well, why you want to talk now? You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it was crazy. Then we played some pickup games mm -hmm. uh, with the normal team, couple other guys, and I'm doing my thing, looking like me. Everything is cool. Mm -hmm. But by the time practice started, bro, well, first of all, we went to Summer League. Summer League went okay. Uh, I came off the bench first game, got in the game, did really good. I think I started mm -hmm. the next game. 
And um, but it was just weird. Then they picked up like three more games, and and I ain't gonna lie, man, my legs were beat because I had that crazy summer. Now we mm. pick up all these extra games in the summer league, and it, it went okay, bro. But the chemistry wasn't that good. The vibe was weird. Um, mm. it, it just it just it just wasn't the type of stuff I was used to. And then and then going somewhere where the coach doesn't really you know believe in playing freshmen and I mean rookies that was weird. But the thing about it is though is you know how when you're in a situation where oh rewind to this first Mm -hmm. day of summer league bro before practice even started we're doing the warm-up jog before we stretch Mm -hmm. and hubie brown goes you're not at boston college anymore bell i'm thinking to myself (laughs) i'm like bro we haven't even hit the layup line like this is the 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 warm-up jog before we stretch to play basketball I knew right there, bro. I said, I am in the wrong place. <laughs> and, yeah. and from there, it just got worse. It just got worse and worse, bro. It just mm. got worse and worse. Not to mention, not to mention, bro, that me and Dante Jones at the back at that time, I mm. never liked him. So, mm. so it started at the uh at the Colorado USA tryouts, right? So mm. I didn't like Dante. He was always running mm. his mouth. I just didn't like dude. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. we got to be okay, but I never liked dude. Mm-hmm. So then on draft day, I, I'm doing the interviews outside my house. I look in, they're like going to Memphis, Dante Jones. I'm like, Dante Jones, <laughs> you coming with me? I'm like, yeah. it was it, it bro, it was it was then their sabotage from yeah, the from before just I even all got that, it. right? It, it just it, it was crazy. It was crazy. Like it just kept being one thing after another, but more than anything, bro. Mm-hmm. Oh, and then after my rookie year after playing 36 minutes and having like 11 points in like seven or eight games, something Mm. crazy like that. I'm Mm. watching all these rookies I destroyed, Mm. dudes I used to, I mean, having success. All I ever needed was minutes, bro. That's all I ever needed was minutes, but I didn't Mm. get none of those. So then, so I played no time, and then we're about to go to summer league, and uh, I tear my knee up again, bro. Tear Mm. my knee up again, my left knee. So that's three surgeries in like, what, three years, four years, something like that. Mm-hmm. And after the, and after that last one, I got to be bone on bone. Mm-hmm. And that just set me back, bro. And even with everything I'm saying, if I would have been, if I just could have been healthy, I still would have, I still would have figured it out and overcame because I was actually, me, Dante, and Stroh Miles Hooper supposed to get traded to the Lakers mm-hmm. um, that summer, but my yeah. injury blew the trade. Mm. My injury blew the trade, bro. Mm-hmm. So you had to come back to Memphis? Yep. So, yep. So I just stayed there. I missed summer league. So I got no playing time fresh rookie year. Mm-hmm. Um, I missed summer league. I'm mm-hmm. going into a uh, training camp. Started off kind of slow, but I picked it up. I, we played like a game against Atlanta. He started me. I played like 25, 27 minutes. I had a good game, you know, 14, 15 points, like seven, eight assists, something like that. It was good. Even though I had a RoboCop knee brace on, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was still cool. <laughs> Yeah. You know what I mean? And then then I bumped knees with Earl Watson. I want to say like the next practice, my knee swole back up. And and that was it, bro. I was uh my knee was done. And then and what's so crazy, if I didn't know the rules, bro, if I don't contacted my agent and told him how hurt I was, I don't know if you can release dudes that are hurt like that. I don't know the rules, don't quote me, but I feel mm-hmm. like if I'd have let him know, mm-hmm. you know, maybe something could have happened different. Yeah. But it, I didn't I didn't communicate with him that much because I was so used to playing through pain and injuries, I thought that was normal. You know what yeah. I mean? I I was just young and just trying to do everything on my own. I didn't really, I just assumed everybody was hurt. That's what I assumed because I had been hurt for so long. I just mm-hmm. was like, well, everyone's hurt, but that's not the case. Everybody mm-hmm. wasn't hurt. And I didn't communicate, you know, the, the way I would have, you know, yeah. in hindsight. In hindsight, right. So um, th- at that time or during your time there, did anyone have an issue with your position or your your game for your size? Like wanted you to play more point guard or? Well, you know, that's all I was playing. I wasn't mm-hmm. playing no two. And I, and, I, and really, I played, you know, a lot of point guard, like, most of the time, you know, in college. So it wasn't, like, a big deal. But, you know, when you when you go somewhere, bro, where mm-hmm. someone – where because I what happened was Jerry West wanted me. I don't think Hubie Brown wanted me. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, looking mm-hmm. back on everything, if Marcus Banks would have – because that's what we got traded for. If Marcus would have went to Memphis and I would have went to Boston, like I was like, – like, like the trade was – yeah. I would everything would have been cool because Hubie wanted more of like a pit bull pick up full court type point guard and Boston didn't need a point guard that much at that time because they had Antoine bringing it up Paul Pierce I would have fit in perfect with those guys yeah. but going to Memphis that was like the exact 
that was like the worst place I could have possibly gone. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like from a basketball <clears throat> standpoint, I'm talking right. about. Yeah, just from a fit standpoint, right? I agree. I think yeah, you would have fit in with those guys in Boston more. So where does it, where does and, it, and, and, and like, and like seven teams try to trade for me the day after the draft. I remember Jerry told me, he was like, yeah, all these teams called this, mm -hmm. that, uh, and, and he was like, yeah, but we're going to keep you. And, and see, I, you know, at the time you're like, okay, cool. That's love. But, mm -hmm. but looking at, you know, how everything played out, it's like, whoo, sure yeah. wish I could have hopped on one of them trades. <laughs> <laughs> for real. So, um, where does it go from, from there then after the Memphis thing? So after Memphis, bro, let me see. So, so boom. So me, so the whole locker room, every mm -hmm. the whole team's in the locker room and they're about, they're about to cut people right in front of everybody. It was crazy, right? Never mm -hmm. heard of nothing like this. Mm -hmm. So, so they cut Bo out first and Bo was making 7 million that year. So when they cut Bo, I'm like, Ooh, I know I'm going because if they're going to eat that $7 million contract, I know they're going to, they're, they're going to chew up this little, the rest of this little 2.5, right? So they mm -hmm. come, Bo, Bo, Bo was a good dude. Bo was a homie, man. Bo, Bo got emotional, you know what I mean? Mm. And, um, you know, because, you know, Bo, Bo, he just got a big heart, man. Good dude, you know what I mean? And then, then they called me in the office next. I already knew, I already knew what it was, obviously. And, um, and you know what, bro? It's so crazy because, like, like, on one hand, like, you're more kind of embarrassed. You know what I mean? You're like, damn, I got cut. I never got cut before. Yeah. I never got cut. Yeah. And but then on the other side, like there was just so much like it, it was it was it was a rough time because like let me just give you an example. So you know how they do the popcorn in the car thing, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For the rookies, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. so so they had got us one time outside uh, all of us, me the Ron Smith, Dante Jones, they even got the uh, the trainer because yeah. he was a rookie. Yeah. So I'm like, man, y'all got the trainer. Y'all are yeah. bogus. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, but I'm like, whatever. You know what I mean? Everybody got the popcorn. Who am I to be different? You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Mm -hmm. But but then, but then there was, oh, before I get to that. <laughs> so, so just imagine this, bro. I'm in an NBA practice mm -hmm. with my Mercedes Benz keys in mm -hmm. my spandex mm -hmm. so that they can't get my keys and put popcorn in my car. Just imagine this, bro. Just yeah. imagine you're at a, think about what you know about the NBA. Yeah, yeah. I'm at an NBA practice, bro, <laughs> hiding my keys under my balls so that they can't take, so yeah. that they can't take my keys. Uh -huh. think, think about that though, bro. You work That's your whole crazy. life, you get to the NBA and I gotta hide my keys. Yeah. So that I can have a a, 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 a dry car to drive yeah, home yeah, yeah. in after practice. <laughs> so that's just letting you know what uh -huh. type of clownery is going on yeah. at this team, right? Mm. So, so bro, the one time I feel like the one time, bro, they caught you lacking. I think I, I, I think I suited up. I suited up. So yeah. I got there early, bro. I put my keys under my lock, <laughs> under 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 some insoles. Under just a random pair of shoes, I'm talking. About, I had like 20 pairs of shoes. Like you had to look for these keys under the insole <laughs> to find this. I'm we're playing Dallas, bro. This is back when uh, Nowitzki and Nash played on the same team, mm. and um, I think I had somebody in town, bro. So mm. you know, whatever. So the game's over, and T Smith. We're in the shower. I'm in the shower with James Posey. T Smith come over. He like, uh, hey, yo, T Bell. Uh, your car is full of popcorn and hella white kids are eating popcorn out your car. Oh. And I think, I think, I think Posey did it. Right. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm like, and I'm in the shower with Posey. I'm like T Smith. Nah, Posey didn't do that <laughs> because if he, because, because if he did that, he wouldn't be talking to me. Right. We wouldn't be having a conversation. You're not going to tell me that this dude right now, we're having a conversation and he popcorn in my car. You're not going to tell me that. You know what I mean? Yeah, Cause yeah. for me, bro, for me, bro, as you could tell, like I'm a nice guy. But yeah, I'm yeah. either nice or I'm not nice. I don't yeah, got no yeah. middle. It's either a dunk or a three with me. You feel okay, me? Okay, okay, okay. No, and no mid-range pull-ups <laughs> and no free throws, yeah. none of that. So yeah. so let's keep in mind, I'm getting no playing time. I'm hella uh -huh. frustrated. I don't like my situation. And I got popcorn in my car after a game, right? And you in the so, shower with the dude. 
I'm in the shower <laughs> with this dude. He's having a conversation like he didn't even popcorn my car, bro. Yeah, yeah, and I'm talking about, I'm talking about they open the sunroof and put the uh the circus bags of yeah, popcorn yeah. Mm -hmm. in your car, bro. You know the mm -hmm. big joints, mm -hmm. the circus joints. Yeah. So so I'm like, uh, I'm like, hey yo, Posey, yo. Did you put some popcorn in my car? I'm tight, but I'm trying to keep it together because I ain't got confirmation, right? So, so he's like, "Yeah, Rook, you didn't, you didn't bring the donuts." I'm like, "I'm like, all right." So I got dressed, bro. Lightning speed, I got dressed. I run out there, man. My little Benz that I still have today, and Dante's mm -hmm. Range Rover is mm -hmm. pulled up in the valet. I don't even valet because it's ten steps. I'm not that lazy, mm -hmm. and. And um, bro, doors open. Um, it's 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 the popcorn shop. All the mm. kids are eating popcorn out of our car. It's a celebration, yeah. and I'm <laughs> about to have a nervous breakdown. You feel me? Yeah. So I run back in that mm. locker room, top speed, bro. Mm -hmm. I am about to whoop <laughs> James Posey, and just that's what's gonna happen. You know what I mean? Yeah. The disrespect that I felt at that moment, you know, <laughs> unbelievable. I can't believe this dude is talking to me in the shower after he did this to my car. So I come in there. Hey, hey. You know, How do you even find your keys? Bro, he, I think he had the manager do it because we had a game. So this dude's playing the game, stretching, still thinking, man, let me put some popcorn in, in this rookie's car. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, bro, needless to say, I'm mm -hmm. about to put it all on the line and, uh, you know, give him an old-fashioned ass whooping, right? So. Yeah. I run back in the locker room. James Posey's gone though. He went mm. from being sud from being sudded up, mm -hmm. just <laughs> taking a shower, lollygagging, to yeah. this dude is gone, right? So yeah. I'm looking for him everywhere. I'm trying to find this dude. Yeah. Can't find him. Call his phone. Phone's off. I left him a message, bro. It, it, it went something like this. I'm gonna obviously I'm gonna uh, clean it up for you, but, <laughs> but something along the lines of, hey man. Mm -hmm. You only do this to somebody that you don't respect. Clearly, you don't respect me. Uh, we got, we got a problem. Period. Yeah, just yeah, like yeah. that. You know what I mean? Obviously, it was way more than that. Yeah. And but this is this is YouTube. We're not going to get into all that. You know what I mean? Right. So, so um, so the next day in practice, bro. So mad at this dude. Mm -hmm. Like I'm 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 mad. Mm -hmm. So he shoot he's shooting shots, right? He's shooting his shots. Every time he shot his shot. I threw the ball at his ball, <laughs> right? So just imagine this. Just imagine mm -hmm. this. But but check, but, they, but check it out though, right? So I'm the guy that got to practice with my keys under my balls in the NBA, right? Yeah. So I'm I'm basically I'm basically like, yo, man, enough is enough, right? Y'all been like, I'm not getting no playing time. I don't like my situation. This is the whole the whole thing has been awful. I'm watching dudes I ran circles around yeah. get playing time. You're, you're disrespecting my car. Like this goes against everything I believe in, bro. Mm -hmm. So he's shooting shots. I'm I'm hitting his ball every time. His ball is going all around the gym, bro. Just yeah. imagine. I, I, do you? I'm I'm gonna try to show you my arm. You see my arm? I'm throwing I'm throwing my ball at his ball like this. I yeah, got yeah. a ball like this. So that uh -huh. ball is flying around this little D three gym. <laughs> so, and I'm and I'm just waiting on him to say anything to me. Yeah. He could have said anything, yeah. and I would have scraped him. You know. And don't get me wrong. This is not stuff I'm proud of. I'm just telling you what happened. You know what mm -hmm, I mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So somehow, somehow he managed to not say anything or even look at me. Mm -hmm. Practice starts mm -hmm. and, that, and nothing even happened. I didn't talk to Posey probably for about, probably till down to the end of the season. You know what I'm saying? And then, mm -hmm. and then when he finally talked to me, he was like, he said this, he said, hey, Rook, if you would have punched me, I'd have been dialing my lawyer as I was falling down. <laughs> <laughs> so bro i'm like i said so i said something to him that i'm not gonna say yeah. and uh and that was it you know what i mean but but my thing was this bro and i and, I, and this this was just my experience like mm -hmm. you know me i show love like like i taught the freshmen how to cut hair like mm -hmm. I, I i put them up on game like i did all this stuff i'm used to love from my teammates bro when mm -hmm. i got to memphis like, it just wasn't that. I mean, I'm not saying dudes weren't cool. There was some cool dudes. Shane was cool. Mike Miller's cool. Earl's cool. Dudes are cool, especially when you're, like, alone with them. But, mm -hmm. like, just the vibe, bro. It just wasn't a vibe I was used to. Like, first day I get to the gym, uh, uh, Lorenzo Wright, uh, RIP, um, he, he, got, he was on my case about a boom box, right? 
Mm-hmm. So I, I got so I bought a boom box so we could have some music, whatever. I'm a rookie. I'll get the boom box. It wasn't no big locker room. We mm-hmm. don't need no floor model boom box for this little locker room. I yeah. come back with the boom box. He's like, it's not big enough. Yeah. I'm like, are we in the are we in the club? Are we about to have a techno party in it? Like, what is it? I'm telling you, bro, like from day one, like yeah. it just, just it weird, just was bro. weird, bro. Like one time, one time he had invited me. Um he had I was in my room chilling. Like he invited me to come eat with him. Him, Jay Will, me, Dante, Renzo Wright, him and Jay Will, right? So mm-hmm. we get down there, bro. We get down to PF Chang's. Mm-hmm. I'm like, hey, what you want, Rook? I'm like, oh, I'll have a water. You know what I'm saying? And like a salad. Like I'm talking about like a garden salad, bro. Like like six, seven bucks. Mm-hmm. Bro, they threw the they ordered up all this food. The bill was like a thousand dollars. Like, and they threw me the bill. Threw mm-hmm. it to me. Mm-hmm. The guy that wasn't even trying to go. Yeah. Man, I rolled that man, I rolled that bill up through it and him <laughs> like, man, you better get out of here. Left him like a 10 and I kicked rocks and Dante ended up paying it. But my thing is this though, bro, like, like it's like you get to the league, and I'm talking about my situation. I talk about all teams because I had some friends that had some amazing experiences. But for mm-hmm. me, it's like you guys aren't the reason I'm here. None of you guys were recruiting me, watching my games. The only thing you guys did different than me was you were born before me. Mm-hmm. Where I come from, where I come from, respect is earned because mm-hmm. it's shown and it's mutual. It's like, bro, when I got there, man, it was just, it was just some weird stuff, bro. It was mm-hmm. some weird stuff that I wasn't used to. Like when I'm telling you that I couldn't have went to a worse situation for my personality, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. that that was that was what I encountered, bro. That mm-hmm. just was not what I was used to. Like, like I said, I go to BC, it's love. High school, it's love. AAU, it's love. Like, like even the USA team, when you got all them egos, like mm-hmm. it, it was still cool. You know what I'm saying? It was cool enough. There was some weird stuff every now and then, but it was cool. Like mm-hmm. it just the vibe bro it just mm-hmm. wasn't the vibe i was used to and i knew it was doom like as soon as i saw that dante jones was going with me you know what i mean like <laughs> i just yeah. never got along with dude like first yeah. day i meet dude we're, we're chilling in the hallway at the uh in colorado he comes at me like yeah uh jason williams uh outplayed you or something i'm thinking to myself bro you were at Rutgers. i was at bc i stayed i'm player of the year you're like the first transfer to go to Duke because you're friends with Jay Will. Like, like everything you 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 you've been getting stuff just given to you. Yeah. I stayed on the worst team, turned it around, got player of the year, became mm-hmm. an all American. I'm thinking to myself, bro, you weren't even playing in the game. Why are you talking to me? You yeah. feel me? So that's introduction to Dante Jones, right? Mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. that's the intro. <laughs> and it just kept getting worse and worse from there, bro. So then mm-hmm. to see he was coming with me and it was it it was just doomed from the start, bro. It was doomed, <laughs> and it, it's funny too because I seen I seen like, like people say like, yeah, well, Troy wasn't gonna make it, and this and that, and I, 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 like little sports writers and stuff. I'm like, bro, y'all are crazy. Like, so you're gonna tell me that I do all the stuff I do, mm-hmm. I've succeeded in everything I've ever done, mm-hmm. um, and then all of a sudden I can't play basketball no more? No, no. If you go to the wrong place. It's like in a relationship, bro. You're dating the wrong, the wrong girl. Even if it goes for a week or two, you're like, oh, man, I got to get up out of this. I don't know. I don't, yeah. You got to do it quick. You know what I mean? Like, it just, it just was a bad fit, bro. But at the same time, like, you know, you know, life ain't, life ain't a fairy tale. And things yeah. don't always go the way you want them to. And that's the bottom line. You feel mm-hmm. me? That mm-hmm. was the biggest thing that I picked up from the whole situation. Because if I could have stayed healthy, I still could have figured it out like I always do. Mm-hmm. But, but in combination with, with the situation and the injuries, that's what really doomed me. The injuries doomed me first, yeah. but the situation didn't help nothing. Mm-hmm. But, but yeah, bro, it was it was a weird vibe, bro. Like yeah. there was a lot of times where I, where I just was like, was just like, man, like how did I get in this situation? In this situation. You know what I mean? Yeah. So what, what was Europe like? Because you already oh, had man. these injuries. Uh, yep, yep. What was that like? Your, Europe was tough, bro, in the beginning because so I go to Real Madrid, right? Uh, which is like kind of like being in the NBA and mm-hmm. um, in Spain, it's an amazing place. But I didn't, I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't fully myself. You know what I mean? I was coming off that knee injury. Um, I, I just, I just wasn't myself, bro. Um, and then, and then while I was there, when I started like feeling a little better, I ended up tearing my groin. So, so, um, so then I leave there with a torn groin, and then I went to Chicago. And that's when I started working out in Chicago. That's when I was uh, started getting back on track a little bit. Okay. 
I think we got it all, man. I think we got it. Anything else you want to say? Nah, bro. Nah, you mm -hmm. know, it was, uh, I'm sure there's way more stories, but this is all just popping on the top of my head. You know what I mean? But nah. you, but it's funny, it's funny mm -hmm. because you called it, like when you were, when you said you were doing your research, you were like Memphis, it, it just wasn't the fit, bro. It just yeah. wasn't the fit. Mm -hmm. And I, and I had workouts where you're like, this would be a, this would be a nice fit. And I'm not going to lie. When I went to Memphis, everything felt good because it was just a workout. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But, but, uh, I had no idea even then that, uh, that it was, you know, going to turn out the way the way it turned out. Yeah. All right. So, anything you want to say about uh, the climate? What's going on now? Maybe something to give uh, a gem to give the young young ballers out there, or just young people. Period. Coming up in a time like now. Man, you know this. You know we're experiencing stuff that we've never experienced, man. And you know, I don't. I don't really know. Uh, what to say because usually you know you speak from experience you know this this is new for all of us man so i just kind of feel like i just more than anything bro i just hope that uh that some of the racism can uh i mean what do you say it can't fade away so it's like i don't know i just i, I just think the racism stuff is just so unnecessary but obviously it's a staple in america uh mm -hmm. it's something we've been dealing with since the beginning of time i just more than anything bro i just hope that uh that some of that can start to calm down and we can get mm -hmm. more understanding for each other and uh and give people a chance instead of just judging people for for no reason no no real reasons right so for those young those young guys coming from high school going into college like the reason i asked you at the beginning when you said how focused you were going into your freshman year that was so amazing to me cuz going into my freshman year like you said i was i was the opposite like oh you know things will just kind of work out you know what i mean i had no guidance telling me, yeah. you know, no, you need to, you need to t take advantage of this opportunity, you know, but you naturally had that. So and you can be a guidance to someone watching this as well. Like, what can you say to that baller going into his freshman? Year? <clears throat> you know what, bro? I would, I would just say, set your own goals. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I mean, obviously as people, we can do whatever we want mentally. We can write down our goals, set them, do whatever, but, but also it's not just setting a goal. It's, it, it's really, really believing in that goal, taking it seriously and trying to execute every day. Because when I, when I got to high school, um, it was the same thing for me, bro. I was five, seven as a freshman and I averaged like 18 a game, you know, and I was like 125 pounds and all those guys were bigger and stronger, but I knew what I was there to do. You know what I mean? Like I grew up in the inner city. I went to a Catholic school, like all white school and not a, definitely a school I wouldn't have been able to afford had I not been a basketball player. So with, you know, I'm already knowing that I, this is like a privileged situation for me. And I just always wanted to make the most of those opportunities because growing up in inner city, you know, there's a lot of guys that don't get opportunities at all. And I had friends, I have friends, bro. I, there was this one guy, man, in, in the neighborhood, he was cold, but he was a blood. So he yeah. was like one of the coldest hoopers, but he was like a family blood. Like he was born into the bloods. Like, yeah. like he was doomed from the start. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Mm -hmm. But but as far as just natural talent, man, this dude was nice. I'm talking mm -hmm. about nice, bro. He was nicer than me. I'm mm -hmm. not, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how tall he ended up growing. He ended up getting shot in the head when we were like 17 or 18. But I don't know how okay. tall he would have been or anything. But yeah. but Buddy was nice. And I, and I always, even now, I still think about him sometimes because, you know, and I think, I think almost anyone can attest to this if you've been around enough hoopers in the inner city. There's a lot of guys that can play. But there's a lot of guys that'll never get the opportunity because of their attitude, their living situation, um, their temper. Mm. Um, uh, there's a variety of, of different reasons why guys won't get opportunities. They're academics, you yeah. know what I mean? So, mm. so understanding all that at a young age and understanding how how lucky I was to have two parents that actually like worked and cared about me, I really tried to maximize every opportunity that I had. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's what's so up. It was, <clears throat> That's yeah. what's up. Appreciate that. Man, I had an amazing time talking to you, man. I didn't think it would go this well. You seem like a genuine dude. So I just want to tell you, I appreciate this time. <clears throat> I know you're busy. <clears throat> no, it's all good, bro. I just had to, you know, I had to, had to, these kids was doing their thing and I had to make sure I did what I said I was going to do with them. But nah, bro, it's all good, yeah. you know. And then when I saw your page, when I saw mm -hmm. your page, I said, man, this is a really cool, like, conversation piece because as you know 
there's a lot of guys that can play, but if you go to the wrong situation, it's over. Exactly. That's it. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. over. The wrong injury. Mm-hmm. It, it's it, it can mm-hmm. go so fast. So so when I was looking at some of the guys you had on there, I was like, I knew I knew that we were gonna talk eventually because I'm like, this is a cool conversation. Like mm-hmm. this is this mm-hmm. this whole topic is crazy. And a lot of people, they just be like, Oh, he was a bust or he was a bum or he was this or he was that. And that's that's not the case. It's that something happened and mm-hmm. like you're digging to get the story, bro. So I think that's super cool. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Appreciate that. So what's life like for you now? Bro, doing the family thing, man. I'm I'm about to get married in like two months and I got my two little kids and mm-hmm. just trying to just trying to get adjusted to phase two, man. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, fortunately <clears throat> I'm able to be home with my kids and, and that, that means a lot to me because I miss a lot of time with my dad playing ball overseas and he passed a few years ago. So I'm just trying to get that time in, man, with my kids before I get back on the road and start working or I don't know what I'm gonna do yet, but I'm I'm just trying to be I'm just focused on my family and my kids and, and getting that time in before I gotta get busy again, you know. Yeah, condolences, man, to your to your father. Oh, I appreciate yeah, it. I mine, appreciate mine it. Passed man. too, a long time ago. But uh, thanks, yeah, man. You know, I appreciate. You, you know how it is. Condolences yeah, to you too, bro. Yeah, yeah. Appreciate you, man. Stay oh, for safe sure. out there. I, I mean, I'm gonna try my best, man. Have yeah. a good one. Yeah, you too, man. Thank you. Right on. All right, see you.